Two years ago, we spent months of our lives dedicating every waking moment, all of our energy, all of our focus to a single goal, to find the perfect floating home for our family. There's a lot at stake here. I'm really curious what's gonna happen, so let's jump in there and see what we think. We road tripped up and down the East Coast of the United States, strategized with experts, spent our nights editing videos and our days touring every boat we could get our hands on, all in search of the best blue water boat we could afford. We had a really strong sense of what we wanted our future boat to prioritize and what compromises we were willing to accept. But that was all very theoretical. But now, after living on the boat for two years, exploring a huge variety of coastlines, sailing across the Atlantic, and much of the Mediterranean, it's time for us to take a step back and ask ourselves, did we make the right choice? We'll give our honest thoughts on how well the Pacific Seacraft 40 suits our needs. It's not a very easy boat to maneuver. What we think of the various systems and design elements. I mean, this cockpit is small. We'll discuss what kind of sailor might benefit from this kind of boat and what kind of sailor might not. And finally, we'll answer the question, did we buy the wrong boat? We can't really extend this Dodger because the space to go forward on the side deck is so small. It is such a pain to go, as I call it, dumpster diving. Doesn't this bed feel a little small to you? This is our first, you know, kind of storm rolling through with life as a family at anchor. And I kind of forgot how nice it feels when you're in an anchorage that has really good protection that has really good holding and there's a storm passing through. There's just something so special about being in a situation that could be sketchy, but feeling really comfortable. So yeah, feeling good, man. And East is loving it, just hibernating. <laughs> and that's kind of what we're all doing. I just did a load of Issa's diaper liners. I figured I should wash them and at least have them hanging up outside. But yeah, I actually love rainy days on our boat. It's just a really good excuse to be cozy. I actually love the sound of raindrops on the cabin top. Mmm. Who's that? Is that Dad? Mm. Now dad will kiss Isa. <laughs> well, you ready to go sailing today, buddy? Oh, I forgot we're moving today. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Well, we're getting ready to get underway and it is so pretty out right now. It's really, really clear and calm, but there's also a slight breeze and it's a little bit of a cold breeze, so it's actually really refreshing. Isa has finally fallen asleep. So when Isa was a newborn, she was diagnosed with face syndrome and so we had to see a bunch of specialists and so Isa was in the car, in particular in this car seat a lot. <laughs> That's one nice thing about having this car seat be our kind of like deck solution for now to keep her safe is that she's really comfortable in it and she's accustomed to sleeping in it and she's holding on to my little pinky finger which is what we used to do when I was taking her from hospital appointment to hospital appointment in all the Ubers that we rode around in in Malta. So I gotta pull away my little finger without waking her up and then help Jordan bring the anchor up. And he's still sleeping. Go ahead.
Wow, this is pleasant. <laughs> there is just enough wind to sail by. There's like zero swell, and it's a very, very beautiful day. Captain Issa. Do, do, do. She knows what to do. <laughs> like, Good I, job, I, I baby. I got this. All right, baby, what a nice day, right? So, because the wind is just so light, everything is so calm, figured today is a good day to answer a question that we've been getting a lot lately, which is, how are we happy with the Pacific Sea Craft 40, right? We did a whole boat review series, looking at basically all of the blue water boats within our size range, within our price range on the US East Coast that were available at the time, and the Pacific Sea Craft 40 was what we arrived at. And is this still the boat that we would have chosen? Now that we've sailed for two years on it, we've sailed probably 7,000 miles on it, crossed an ocean, had a baby, got a dog. So we're gonna structure this review the same way that we structured the initial review series. First, we're gonna talk about sailability, then livability, and finally, we'll discuss how these relate to our goals as full-time sailors. So let's start off with sailability. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the helm station here. One thing I really like about this boat is that I have everything that I need right here to navigate the boat. I have really good visibility. I've got all the instruments right in front of me. And I've even got this elevated like hump here, which I didn't know if I would like, but I absolutely love because I can sit here and see the horizon. And when we're sailing and heeled over a lot, there's always a way to sit on this comfortably. If this was flat, you'd kind of want to slide down. I'm able to reach these Genoa sheets and the winches from here. And we put in this new furling line winch so that I can control that from here as well. So I can control a lot of lines from here. I can't control the main sheet and I can't reef the main from here. Now that's super unusual to be able to reef the main from back here, but it would be pretty sweet if I could control the main sheet from back here. So I mean, you can see I've got a little bit of protection from this Dodger, but just barely, right? If you had really strong winds, like when we were on the Atlantic crossing and we had that front passing over us, I mean, the wind was so intense and it was like raining and there was spray that it just sucked to be out here so much and you just got super salty. If we had more protection, you could actually be up here with a relatively high expectation of not getting drenched and not getting soaked and just not being miserable. I mean, this cockpit is small. We can't really extend this Dodger because the space to go forward on the side deck is so small. So if this came aft more, we wouldn't even be able to get in and out of the cockpit hardly. If we're just doing a day sail, it's fine. You could probably fit six people out here, maybe even eight. But for passage making, I think two people is the optimum number of people who can be out here comfortably. So the last thing about the cockpit area is during our boat hunt, in theory, I was looking for a boat with all of the control lines leading aft to the cockpit like it does on this boat. And I wasn't sure if I was gonna like it or not. I was a little worried that lines would kind of get snagged and caught up and so that I would have to go forward anyway. But the way that it's been working on Atticus is great. Reefing the main is really easy from here. We've never had any problems. Reefing the head sails with the furling lines and stuff, especially now with that winch is great. So I'm a huge, huge fan of lines being led aft to the cockpit now. I would not have it any other way. Let me see the baby. Come here. As far as this cockpit size and shape and everything for having a baby on board, I love it. Like we're under sail right now. Sure, we're going pretty slowly and it's very calm conditions, but I feel really good having Isa out here. It's a deep cockpit. So like the distance from the bottom to the combings right. and the distance from the bench to the top of the combings. It's all very deep. So yeah. yeah. So because of that, it feels very safe and cozy. And as for this stern rail bimini solar arch davit structure that we had built. I love it. I love everything about it. It's a huge improvement. The stern rail is super good for safety. Like it would be hard to get thrown out of this cockpit by accident. The bimini does a good job of shading everything and so do the solar panels. I do wish if the boat weren't a canoe stern, then we could put up more solar and that would be great because we have 800 watts of solar and it keeps up with our demand if we're relatively low key about what we're using. If we're running the water maker, the washing machine, uploading footage with Starlink, all that, this doesn't really keep up with it. And then these seats right here were actually an afterthought. Like they were not a part of the original design and they are actually 
super clutch. I highly recommend something like this because you can hang out here and have a really, really good view of everything around you. So for us, that's been huge, like in places with a lot of crab traps and floating stuff, you can sit here and really keep an eye out. If there's a lot of traffic, you can hang out here. Just anytime that you need really, really good visibility, this is a great place to hang out and you have access to all of the instruments and GPS and everything. So as you can see, there's not even enough wind for the Genoa to be doing much right now. So we don't have the staysail out, but the last thing I want to say about sailability of this boat is I love the fact that it's a cutter. This is the first cutter that I've owned and sailed much, and I wouldn't go with any other rig for offshore sailing. The great thing about the cutter is that we unfurl it the moment we start a passage, and then when the wind picks up, all we do is furl in the Genoa until the Genoa is completely gone, and then the stay sails there. When the wind gets strong, you want a nice tight sail that's flat, and that's what you can achieve with a stay sail. As as you furl up a Genoa, you get the opposite. It almost becomes like a parachute. So you're getting a lot of force on the boat. It's pushing the boat over a lot, but not really propelling the boat much. The stay sail is super small, super tight, super flat. So once you get rid of the Genoa, you've got all that propulsion that you want and none of the pushing the boat over for no reason. Yeah, I think probably my favorite part of this boat is this center hallway right here it makes it so easy to get up and down even when the boat's totally just rocking and rolling all i do is i wedge myself against whichever side i've got available and then just slide myself down right and i can do this with no hands like what boat can you do that on then once i'm in the galley again all these fiddles are great you know, I can just wedge myself in between here. Boom, I'm cooking. When we were staying on our friend's Ahanze, the interior was so beamy and it felt like this really nice open layout. It was like an apartment. It's just this amazing apartment. And I will say for comfort at anchor, that's really nice. But for peace of mind and comfort and safety while we're sailing, I would go for this boat any day. And yeah, I've been thinking about just how many people actually benefit from a boat like this. And I do think it's very, very few because realistically, production boats that are a lot cheaper and a lot lighter, they'll sail better in light winds, they'll be more commodious down below, they'll have more ability to entertain and have fun up on deck. So the person that goes out on the weekends or has a one week trip or two week trip every summer, like for someone like that, a production boat is a really great choice. A boat like this is all about making those long distance trips that we wanna do regularly fun and comfortable as opposed to just kind of miserable so that we actually want to keep doing those voyages that's what it's all about having a boat that changes your mindset that changes our incentives to actually pursue these lofty goals of long distance traveling so I do want to talk a little bit about the performance of the boat and how happy I am with it after having sailed it for two years I think it's important to note that any boat is going to be somewhere on a spectrum of really fast really maneuverable and really good at sailing in light winds. And then on the other end of that spectrum, it's gonna be really comfortable offshore, really good at sailing in big waves and really strong winds. So you're gonna have to compromise. You end up somewhere on that spectrum. No boat does everything perfect. I would say that this boat is really moderate. Like it's really in the middle. It's pretty darn comfortable in average to somewhat intense offshore conditions, yet it still sails pretty darn well in light airs. I mean, literally right now there's like four knots of wind and we're doing almost two knots, right? Like that's great. I will say one bummer about this boat is when I have to maneuver in tight quarters in a marina, getting to some funny shaped fuel dock. It's not a very easy boat to maneuver in close quarters. And I do wish that I had a bow thruster on this boat. That would just make my life easier. And then it also draws just over six feet. So another downside is that it's harder for us to get into really shallow anchorages. And that's the price that we pay for that offshore stability, that 
ability to sail to windward, all of that. Generally speaking, like beyond just wind strength, the ability for the boat to sail, the ease of steering, the ability for it to sail upwind, downwind, all of that, like I have been really thrilled with the performance of the boat. There is a lot to love about the sailability of the Pacific Seacraft 40. I love the instruments that are all at the helm station. I love all of the lines being led back to the cockpit. I love how deep the cockpit is. The cutter rig is perfect for sailing off shore and the interior is optimized for seaworthiness offshore as well. The boat's design is a really nice balance between sailing well in light winds and heavy winds. The only downsides I can think of for sailability all revolve around the fact that the boat has a canoe stern. Because of the canoe stern, the cockpit is fairly small, which leads to the fact that there is minimal protection from the elements in the cockpit and the canoe stern limits how much solar that we can put up. So I would say we gave this boat five out of five stars when we first reviewed it and I would still give it five out of five. Good morning lady, welcome back to the world. There's a really cool little flat bay over there. Do you see it? It looks like at the bottom of a crater. Hi! <laughs> oh, very cool. Nice to meet you. <laughs> That's awesome. That's cool. Okay, bud, go ahead and drop. Oh, so it's like, thank you so much for not going off to sea for two weeks. He's so happy. Good boy. Happy too, baby. Isa thinks it's funny too. Is that funny? Is that dad? Isa, look. She's like, where? I don't see him. Yeah, oh, so it's like, he's right there. <laughs> So for a while now, we've been using the sponsor of today's video, Babbel, to learn Spanish, Italian, Turkish. Like the other day, we went to an Italian restaurant and the waiter who was from Italy asked what I would like and I figured I'd try out my Italian. So I answered, Vorrei la carbonara e un birra analcolica. Per favore. Now I know it's a really simple phrase, but in my experience traveling, there's nothing quite like the experience of effectively communicating with someone for the first time in a language that you're new to. And that's what I like about Babbel. It focuses on teaching real world conversation. Diamoci da fare. Diamoci da fare. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world, and its lessons prepare you to converse about travel, business, relationships, and more. And now that summer is finally here, it is time to hit the beach, hit the pool, take your sailboat out, whatever your summer activity. Babbel's expertly crafted lessons, games, and podcasts can be the perfect companion while you soak up some sun. So click on the link in the description below or scan this QR to get 60% off of your subscription. And be sure to let us know in the comments what language you're hoping to learn. So besides sailability, the other big category in our review video series was livability. And we're gonna have our livable expert take over. Yeah, I would stand strong by saying that I love this galley. When we're sailing, it's great and comfortable and has all the room I need. And then when we're at anchor, it's also just like the dream galley for me. The one thing that it is missing that is really frustrating is just a little bit more storage space. I love a cabinet here so I could store plates. Right now we keep our plates just like randomly shoved into this random yeah. compartment back here. Yeah, basically when I cook, I have to kind of go into all these other different parts of the boat to get my backup foods because I just don't have enough room in here to keep everything in the galley. So even though this refrigerator and freezer combo is super huge. You can see it goes all the way down to the hull. So this is all just like potential space to keep all of our food. Even though that's the case, I actually stopped using the lower compartment because it is such a pain 
to go, as I call it, dumpster diving. So if I wanted to access that section down there. You have to lift all the stuff out, take yeah. everything out. Right, and that's just not practical when we're underway. And when we're at anchor, it's just really annoying and I don't like doing it. That cuts our available food storage down in half. So eventually one day, I'd really like to install a door here so that we can access the second half of the refrigerator without having to drive me crazy and make me really seasick. And I do love like a house layout where I'm in the galley and I'm actually part of our social scene. Right. So like when we have guests over, I'll just have them sit and hang out while I'm cooking and finishing things up and I don't feel like I'm in the other room. Yeah. That is really cool. Although, so it's all a compromise. Yeah, although I don't know, if we had just a little cabinet from like top of the ceiling here. Right. I'd still be able to see everyone. You'd be gone. Yeah, I would, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but let's face it, who's in the kitchen more? This is gonna be your room. We are in the quarter berth and when we first bought this boat, I was kind of bummed because I thought it would feel a little bit small. And I will say it's still small. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to come across as ridiculous saying it's small. It's right. it's enti it's an entire yeah, room. Sure. The problem is the bed. Yeah, the bed is the small. The bed is yeah. very small. And again, that's just because of the canoe stern, which yeah. just is a huge bummer. So so it tapers a lot at yeah. the end to the point where you really can't have two tall people sleeping in here. Yeah. If you're gonna visit us. One of you better be relatively short. Or you better be really good nuzzlers. Yeah, so this is where I'm sleeping right now. So this is fine for one person. And then I can put this work cloth down and then have access to my tools. This is the compromise right now because there's just not enough good storage that's easy to access for my tools. I think the bathroom is perfect. I could, I'd have zero complaints about the bathroom. Oh, sorry for my storage. I mean, I don't know if everybody feels this way, but I freaking love this throne, dude. The <laughs> toilet, it's like I have so much space. And then on top of that, it's all a fiberglass liner. So there's no rot issues. We don't gotta worry about water at all in here, which is really nice. And then same exact thing as the toilet, the shower is big. I think the shower stall was the largest of all the shower stalls of any of the boats that we saw. And I love that. So between the toilet and this shower, and then now that washing machine, the head is definitely my favorite room in the boat. Okay, moving on to my favorite part of the boat, and that is this nuzzle station. This is like my home base. <laughs> if you're ever wondering, like, I wonder what Desiree is doing right now. It's like lounging, eating, sleeping. Entertaining the baby. Cuddling. <laughs> and then I'll say again, storage wise, it's just like, this looks beautiful. Sure, it's nice and open, but it makes me angry how much untapped potential. <laughs> like, I could fit so much food back there or so many baby things. Like, I'm embarrassed to open this cabinet up right now but another thing, like shelving would have been nice. It's just this one big compartment. <laughs> and like, because I don't have organization, I'm just like <laughs> moving on to the V-Birth. So when we first moved aboard, I was like, doesn't this bed feel a little small to you? And Jordan was like, nah, we're good. Then I got used to it, but I do think it is a small bed. I do agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is like over a foot here. Right. So if the bed really extended there, and there, it would be a big bed. The other frustrating thing was how much space was taken by that V-Birth sink, which has been deleted, and as you can see, is now a bunch of <laughs> boxes <Double work. laughs> to try to increase our storage. I think one of these days, we're just gonna go on like a cabinet frenzy, and we're just gonna build cabinets everywhere, <laughs> like every square inch of the boat, but that is not happening anytime soon. I mean, but saying that, but I think you love this boat and you love the interior. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I'm saying all this because we're get, like shedding a critical eye on what could be a little bit better maybe, but this boat is awesome. I love it. I am I feel so blessed and happy to call this place home. It is it is an amazing boat. So that is very true. And even the details, right? Like the woodwork in here is insanely beautiful. I mean, it is a very freaking pretty boat. And a part of what makes it so pretty is the fact that that was a priority when they built it. And it wasn't just cram as much storage and cabinetry as you can into the thing. You know what else makes it pretty? What? Your two hotties. Hottie number one, hottie number two. Hottie number two likes to eat anything. You gonna talk about your pride and joy? Yes, so Desiree likes the nuz station and the galley. I like the head 
and the nav station. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since we installed this new monitor, this has been totally game changing. My back problems have gotten a lot better now that I can stand and do all of our computer work. And then I'm still able to sit and do computer work and it's very, very comfortable. In my opinion, if you're gonna live, live on a boat, people spend a lot of time on their computers nowadays, almost no matter what you do, right? And so having a very comfortable office part of your boat is huge to me. So I'm happy that they allocated this much boat space for this, I yeah. love it. See, check this out, one-handed. Whoa. One-handed, baby. Wow. I know, that's very impressive. She does love hanging out with you at the workstation. Yeah, this is our... Like, Mom, we have work to do. This is great. This is throne number one. That's throne number two. Gross. So, okay, we gave the livability four out of five initially. Hmm. What would you give it now? Uh, it's tempting to say five out of five because after living on it, I do love this boat. I think it's better than I thought it would be. Mm, that's good to know. So maybe like four and a half out of five. All right, all right. I feel like 4.5 is a fair rating. I love the seaworthy galley, the open visibility of the interior, the huge head, the nuzzle station, the giant nav station, and just basically how beautiful the interior is. But it's still not perfect. There's poor fridge and freezer access. Both the quarter berth and the V berth are a lot smaller than they could be for a boat this size. And finally, there's just not enough storage for long term. From liveaboards. Okay, Bozo, it's time to go. We're gonna go ashore. Are you ready? Yeah? <laughs> okay. He's like, yes! Finally! Oh, I smell a barbecue. You think somebody yeah, will give us some it's food? It's that catamaran. Yeah, we should go ask. Like, hey. We have a YouTube channel, yeah. Yeah, we have a baby. Okay. Oh boy, <laughs> I gotcha. You got <laughs> it. Hey buddy, how's the buddy, huh? Pretty spot, huh? This terrain is nuts like a volcano or something and then there's all these crevices and caves and this feels like a solid ground but then you look around the corner and we are standing on a ledge yeah <laughs> buddy that looks like an epic trail are you ready it looks really cool but i feel like maybe you know osho 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 should scope it out osho you ready and isha and i can watch you and cheer you on from down here okay <laughs> <laughs> This is a slippery trail. Slippery and steep, but very cool. All right, made it to the top. This is beautiful, man. What an unexpected, awesome trail. You're a good adventure, buddy. Let's get you some water. Wanna say goodnight to Dad? Goodnight, baby. Night, Dad, I love you. Goodnight, I love you. I love you, Dad. <laughs> Your cheeks are so kissable. I know. So to conclude our review of the Pacific Seacraft 40, now that we've been sailing on it for two years, we're gonna go over the three priorities that we had when we were on the boat hunt two years ago. The first one was we wanted a boat that would prioritize comfort offshore over comfort at anchor. And I think we kind of answered that today. I mean, the Pacific Seacraft 40 prioritizes comfort, safety, offshore over comfort at anchor. But at anchor, it's still a really, really nice way to live. Yeah, I mean, I, we love it. Yeah, yeah, I don't feel like I'm making too many sacrifices. The second was we wanted a boat that would allow us to sail more and work on the boat less, do less boat work. I think we nailed that one. Yeah, totally nailed it. So moving on. <laughs> so we've done a lot of 
work to this boat in the last Both two years. Both of us, mostly me. I would say that in the last two years, we did more boat work than we did sailing. And we did a lot of sailing. But the real issue is not that this boat needed that much work. This boat, when we bought it, was just about ready to do what the previous owner had done with it, which is go on awesome trips on the weekend to go from one marina to the next, maybe anchor out for a night or two. I really miscalculated how much time and how much money it was going to take to get this boat ready to do what we wanted it to do, which is one, be able to sail long distance on its own power, two, to be able to live off grid for long periods of time. If the work that I did was purely maintenance, we would have done a fraction of the work. I mean, we could have stuck with AGM batteries and used basically the entire existing electrical system, right? I mean, that whole project could have been replacing an inverter pretty much. That was the only part that didn't work. So the way I look at it is living and cruising on a sailboat, just keeping that boat going is like being on a treadmill, but at like a light jog, right? If you wanna keep that boat going and make improvements, you gotta be sprinting on that freaking treadmill. And that's what we've been doing for a lot of the last two years. And we're at a point now where most of the improvements that I wanna do this boat are done. And the rest is mostly just gonna be maintenance. And then every now and then I'm gonna sprinkle in a little improvement here or there. But over the next couple years, I do not foresee doing nearly as much boat work as we have. To answer priority number two, did that work out? Not yet. But I have hope. Like I think that this boat is now ready for some serious adventures, like some really cool stuff. Yeah, and, and I can't wait to just dive into it. Yeah, and I would say, I think for us it's been a long journey, you know, starting with Atticus 1 to get to a point where we have a boat that isn't falling apart underneath us. And that's ready for life off grid. Right, you know? to finally be able to just kind of cruise a little bit. <laughs> it's exciting if you think about it. You know, when we sold Atticus 1, we wanted to upgrade to have a family. And now we have a family and we have a boat that, that can, you know, make our dreams come true. And yeah. I just can't believe we're here. Yeah, I know, I know. So three weeks. We've been living completely off grid. The water tanks are totally topped up. Our laundry is all done. I've taken a shower pretty much every stinking day. And I no longer have an excuse to not shower. Yeah, yeah, and Desiree has had a lack of an excuse every day. Just imagine, that's three weeks. We haven't even tapped into the potential of how long we can just get lost on this thing. So then the last priority was we wanted a boat that would be a good home for a family of four for at least 10 years. Now we are kind of a family of four, but we did not mean oh so. That was not what we meant. You're not a human. We kind of were implying that eventually we'll have two kids, I think. We'd like to. We'd like to, that's the goal. I think that for having one kid, this boat is plenty of boat. What'll be really interesting is with two. I think it'll work for two like small kids, you know, but for now, yeah, I think it's plenty of boat. In one week, Isabella has the last of her medical stuff here in Malta. And after that happens, we are out of here. We're gonna head to Sicily, then head to Greece. And like the epic adventure will officially begin. I'm feeling ready. Yeah, are you feeling yeah, ready? I'm feeling ready too. Like, I feel like there's nothing missing in our like skill set repertoire of sailing and cruising and living on yeah. a boat with a baby. I feel like we've been stuck to shore for such a long time now, especially with Issa's health issues. In a way, I feel like I feel the pull of the ocean now. Like, mm -hmm. Look out there. Yeah. Just flat ocean and I know. the sun, and I'm like, let's go there. Osa's like, guys, I'm happy with just this place. Yeah. Can you just call this place Can home? Can you just pick one yeah. place, please? Right. 